off to the city, strung out on lasers, slash back blazers, ate all your While well, glam rock owes a huge debt to David Bowie and Ziggy Stardust, it owes even more to one of his friends, Mark Boland, and another wild night at the BBC that shocked the nation. She ain't a witch, and I love the way she twitch, uh -huh. The big bang moment for glam was um, almost certainly when T-Rex went on top of the pops and did Hot Love. Uh, they'd had one massive hit already with Ride a White Swan, which kind of set the scene musically. And the next step was when they did Hot Love. Um, Chilita Secunda, who was the wife of Mark Bowen's manager, um, put some glitter around his eyes immediately before he went on stage on top of the pops. And that was it. That was, that was the moment. Because nobody had done that before. Nobody had worn makeup so ostentatiously on on TV. Here was Mark in a silver satin jacket with makeup on his face and this wonderful, iconic corkscrew air of his. He looked utterly different and quite androgynous. So I remember seeing him on TV around a friend's house and suddenly he started to take a real big interest in music and the charts it was a big, big talking point. All the kids on the street were talking about it. It was a real eye-opener. He added visuals to a great new type of sound. Uh, and he was the big bang moment when he came on the scene. Well, I remember that I just loved it. And I liked the way he stood, and I liked the, the way he played guitar, and the way he moved. And it was T-Rex that really made me want to get into music as a, as a career. Like his old friend David Bowie, Mark Boland and T-Rex had become a sizzling pop sensation. Glam mania quickly spread like teenage wildfire. The key moment for me came in summer 1971 when I first heard Mark Boland's Get It On. And that grabbed me in a way that nothing had grabbed me before. And from that moment forward, I was completely obsessed with acquiring every snippet of knowledge I could about Mark Boland, both in his personal life and in his career. No matter who was your pop idol, obsessions like this didn't come cheap for teenagers on a pocket money budget. In 1971, the typical album cost £1.75, £22 today. And it wasn't just vinyl eating up the fans' money. I'd go to the gigs as a teenager and I'd pick up all the merchandise that was on sale. I'd buy it all. I'd buy things like these souvenir rosettes that would cost a fortune. This was probably about a quid, £1.50, something like that, and be basically very simple, but wear it with pride at the concerts. I worked in a local supermarket for a little while, I did a paper round for a little while, and somehow managed to scratch money together to buy favoured records. I actually went out and bought uh, a pile of sequins and sort of sewed them onto a scarf, a Slade scarf. I'd sort of wrap it round my neck and it would reflect at the concerts, so all the lights would come off the sequins so that I could be seen at the gigs and the band would actually look at me and make eye contact. I had quite a bit of time on my hands and I used that time to hunt down Mark Bolin in the West End of London. That's where his management's office were located in New Bond Street. And I made it my business to go down there quite regularly and just sit on the doorstep waiting for him to show up. Uh, I became friendly with about a dozen teenage girls who did exactly the same thing each day. And it became kind of a social club. So one day during February 1975, Tony Howard, Mark's manager, popped his head out of the office door and asked us, his Mark's fans, whether we'd be interested in appearing on a TV show with him um, as his fans, to sit around and gaze admiringly at him. And obviously we jumped at the chance. Here he comes now. <laughs> when the show itself proceeded, he was then asked about how he goes about composing his songs. And at that point, he gestured for me to hand him the guitar, which I did, and he strummed four chords and sang over them. And to my chagrin, I remember exactly what chords he strummed and what words he sang over it. They, they, that's just the nerd in me. And when that section of the show was completed, he then handed the guitar back to me and continued with the interview. Yeah. And uh, 
Can you sign this uh, for our viewers? And sure. We're going to get you to sign several. Well, I used to work at a, a, a club called The Sundown, which was fantastic because, obviously, being a DJ, I, I, I was there for all the discos, but I also worked with uh, T-Rex. The T-Rex was fantastic. Mark Bolan, I found a lovely guy, a really nice guy. He was very accommodating. In fact, uh, after the end of the show, he was so grateful. Uh, I mean, I just, I would have done it for nothing, to be honest with, with you, just to work with the man. But he was so grateful. He gave me the tambourine that he'd used in the show, and he gave me the maracas that he used in the show, and I've still got them. Things changed for me in uh, the summer of 1975. One day, Tony Howard, his manager, popped his head out of the door and asked me to come up to the office for a minute. I was scared. I thought I'd done something wrong. I thought I was going to be given a bollocking. He asked me if I had a job. I said, well, obviously I haven't got a job. I'm here every day. He said, well, yeah, I've noticed that. He said, well, do you want a job? I said, I don't know. What do you mean? He said, well, Mark's going to be doing a short tour coming up soon. Would you like to help out on the crew? I would have torn his arm off. I'd torn his arm off to help out on the crew. I had no idea what would be involved. But you see, it was during those gigs that I got to spend rather more time with Mark than I had previously backstage in the dressing room for hours in between the setup and sound check and before the show commenced there was maybe three hours to kill. We actually got to play together for a few moments and that had an enormous impact on me. Um, that and words of encouragement during that occasion and on subsequent occasions gave me the confidence and motivation to pursue a hobby which has now lasted me all of my life. So this is the album that um, I keep all my Mark Bolan pictures in. Uh, you can see he's autographed it there for me. There was one particular occasion when he must have become aware that I was forever hanging around him with an instamatic camera. And he said to me, so, so Mopsy, these pictures you, you take, can I have a look at them? And he leafed through this album, he, he, he looked at the pictures and he said, these pictures are <clears throat> hopeless, Mopsy, give me that camera, let me show you how to take a proper photograph. And he then took my instamatic camera from me in the middle of New Bond Street and shot a picture of me, which turned out to be equally <laughs> hopeless. One, two, three, go! Yeah! David Bowie and Mark Boland, the two pioneers of glam rock, had partied together, jammed together, and even toured together since they were teenagers. There was a definite rivalry between David Bowie and Mark Boland, without doubt. They, they both knew each other from the 60s, and both were very competitive men, and both wanted to outdo the other. By 1972, Mark Bolan was the biggest pop star in the country. And Bowie was like, when, when Ziggy Stardust came out, he was, he was, he was sneaking up on the rails, but Bolan seemed untouchable. I don't think anybody at that point would have thought David Bowie would become the biggest star or have the longer career. The two old friends had always been competitive, but megastardom magnified their rivalry, and the brothers in glam slowly drifted apart. So I've been working at Trident, and T-Rex used to record at Trident. And I think we were doing, like, uh, I think it was Aladdin Sane, I think it was Siggy Stardust, one of those. So I look at David and I said, David, listen, uh, Mark Boland's upstairs and he's mastering. And he goes, oh, really, T-Rex, wow, ask him to come down. And I went, you know, typical, like, okay, oh, oh, you know, superstars. I said, okay, okay. So I get in the elevator, go upstairs to the third floor, and I walk into the mastering room. And I said, T-Rex, Mr. Boland, Mark Boland. I said, can you, uh, Bowie's downstairs. And Mark Boland says, well, yeah, tell Bowie to come up. So I'm like, okay. So I went back downstairs again. So I walk into the control room. David, he'd love to see you. He goes, well, Dennis, ask him to come down. So now it's like, okay, so I go back upstairs. Mark, he definitely wants to see you. Come down. So he goes, you got it. So he comes downstairs come in the elevator. We go into the room. Now, you've got to imagine this magical moment of two glam rockers. Okay, you've got David Bowie with the makeup and Mark Boland, T-Rex. There they are. And, they, and it's like, hi, man. And they shook hands and then they hugged each other. They talked for like an hour or something. And in those days, Trident didn't allow anybody to take pictures because it was like, artists don't, that's their you know, private time. And I thought, what a magical moment that would have been, just to take a picture of them just shaking hands and hugging the two me me mega stars of glam rock. 
In September 1977, the two founding fathers of glam rock performed together on Boland's ITV series Mark. Nine days later, the music world was shocked to its core. I'd by then um, left the group of teenage girls and I'd taken up employment with a UK high street bank. I'd worked a little late that morning, that Friday morning, and I got dressed as quickly as I could and I marched to work, arriving a few minutes late, and for some reason the staff seemed surprised to see me. My boss seemed surprised to see me. There was a peculiar atmosphere in the office. I said, well, what the matter, only a few minutes late. And my boss called me over and said, you haven't heard, have you? I said, heard what? I was, oh God, you really don't know. You better come with me for a minute. And he led me into the restroom behind the office. He closed the door and he sat down and looked at me very solemnly and said, I'm afraid I've got some very bad news for you, Robin. Your friend and hero, Mark Bolan, was killed in a car crash this morning. I had no idea what to do or say. He said, Robin, I think you better go home. He knew how devoted I was. I think I went numb for a long time after Mark's death. His death left an enormous void in my life because it is present, because my interest in him had been so all-consuming for so many years. You take that away, what, what are you left with?